Socialism and communism are indeed heavy words with a rather troubled history. Their historical legacy is the subject of countless disputes and controversies, both in mainstream politics and within more niche leftist circles. The rich history of class struggle and progressive movements with their idealized sparks, trouble implementations and tragic epilogue has brought forth a new generation of progressives that are confused and anxious to say the least. We are, understandably, insecure about the burden of really existing socialism of the 20th century, a burden that Russian, Chinese and Cuban revolutionaries did not have, as we are apprehensive when it comes to the aftertaste of their legacies in the minds of the average person. We are unsure about the extent of our personal and collective responsibility in relation to these former socialist experiments. Should we defend them, criticize them, condone them, dismiss them? How do we approach the Soviet, Yugoslav, Cuban, Venezuelan and Chinese experiments, their leaders and their peculiar local brands of socialism without alienating the target audience, but nonetheless preserving their historical significance and upholding their legacy? Unsurprisingly, we are treading a thin line between realist dogmatism and idealist utopianism, a line that many comrades are sadly failing to acknowledge for various reasons. Nonetheless, in this video we will try to find a solution for this very conundrum. Now, the reason why I'm even bothering with this topic in the first place is because it only seems sensical to present my attitude towards former socialism clearly and precisely and give new leftists and viewers of this channel some food for thought before they delve into the murky waters of sectarianism. So consider this as a prequel to all upcoming videos and series regarding former socialist experiments, for the sake of avoiding long disclaimers and self-defense monologues in future projects. Now, before I present my conception of a correct Marxist attitude in regards to this question, it would be useful to consider a few existing theoretical lines and camps that you may have encountered and may subscribe to yourself, and clarify my objections to their varied attitudes towards socialism of the past. So allow me to outline them in a few rough categories. Democratic socialists or social democrats, anarchists, Stalinists or Marxist-Leninists, Trotskyists and sectarians. Now allow me to spare a few words on each of these before we wrap up with a final conclusion. Democratic socialists are perhaps the most widespread phenomenon in the Western left, as are potential comrades in the imperial core who fearfully shy away from all forms of meaningful revolutionary upheavals, violent struggle or quote-unquote illegal means. They predictably dismiss all former socialist experiences as quote-unquote totalitarian abominations, as red fascism, etc., effectively regurgitating standard anti-communist narratives while advocating for quote-unquote peaceful and civilized parliamentary introduction of socialism, methods that have continually proven to be futile and ineffective. They tend to stay within the boundaries of socially acceptable political rhetoric, often glorifying pseudo-progressive social democratic projects with their focus on ameliorating capitalism and making it more humane. To every seasoned Marxist, their approach is self-evidently defective and damaging to our cause, as they are nothing but establishment shills whose role is to knowingly or unknowingly co-opt, whitewash, pacify and de-radicalize revolutionary forces while being accomplices and maintaining the illusionary semblance of progressive politics of an otherwise brutal imperialist military-industrial apparatus that they indirectly benefit from. For more insights into why social democracy aka democratic socialism is wholly inadequate, check out some of the sources in the pinned comment down below. Anarchists, on the other hand, tend to dismiss former socialist experiments in a similar capacity, with authoritarianism and totalitarianism as recurring themes that return us to tiresome discussions about the necessity of state power and the dynamics of constructing a post-capital society. Whereas many of their criticisms of Soviet-style socialism, the bureaucratic degeneration of the worker state and other phenomena of really existing socialism are indeed to be considered, their strict anti-authoritarian rhetoric and aggressive non-compliance with all once existing forms of socialism 
often seem detached from material circumstances, pragmatic necessities and wider geopolitical context that necessitate the seizure and wielding of state power as the vessel for constructing socialism. Alas, since their objections are consciously ideological and theoretically well-established and similar to social democrats, hardly fit the framework of Marxist thought, we will move on to the next camp. Marxists-Leninists, or Stalinists for the lack of a better term, stand on the receiving end of all social democratic and anarchist objections. Although so-called tankies usually employ a well-established, principled doctrine whose results and successes are more than apparent, many of them tend to stubbornly defend a predefined orthodox theoretical line, whose failure they often attribute to external factors and unlucky circumstances, while dogmatically reciting Stalinist apologism as loyal cheerleaders of a bygone era, desperate to prove how their team was innocent, dangerously relativizing undeniable mistakes and crimes of the Soviet experiment. Their perspective tends to boil down to the assertion that Stalin did nothing wrong, how the gulags were a vacation and Stalinist purges merely a slap on the wrist, how we ought to unequivocally follow the Soviet model as it's the only one proven by history and so on. It is hereby not uncommon to see the feverish patriotism and accentuation of national particularities, Russophilia and a flourishing personality cult of Stalin as the unmistakable leader of the cradle of socialism, a cocktail of dogmatism and orthodoxy that continues to betray Marxist principles of open discussion and ruthless criticism of all that exists, which is the basis for any dialectical synthesis of new ideas. This strictly anti-revisionist approach often leads to socially conservative, arguably regressive and close-minded regurgitation of a rigid doctrine that had once been politically and violently imposed within the ranks of communist parties and is still fanatically upheld by some as a universal truth, which naturally alienates a large number of people who are understandably repulsed by the overall vibe. I will definitely dedicate separate videos to exploring the mistakes, deficiencies, and inevitable failure of the Soviet model, Stalin himself, and the entire era of 20th century socialism. But for the time being, I sum up my criticism of self-proclaimed staunch Marxist-Leninists as overly ideological, dogmatic, sectarian, often dangerously apologetic and uncritical. Trotskyists, on the other hand, stand as the living embodiment of anti-Stalinist opposition, as the feverish critics of everything wrong with Soviet-style socialism and what Trotsky coined as socialism in one country, the doctrine established by Stalin in the critical historical juncture where the prospect of world revolution was abandoned and the construction of socialism in each individual backyard was initiated. At first glance, the Trotskyist position seems like a sober and healthy attitude to have, until we consider some of the more problematic excesses of devout contemporary Trotskyists. Historically, their whole deal has been the harsh and rather valid criticism of the Soviet bureaucracy and the degeneration of the worker state, which led to the restoration of capitalism, which was, unsurprisingly, often seen as an act of sabotage and defeatism, which is a discussion for another day. However, just like so-called Marxists-Leninists, they seem to forget that that era is no more. There is no Stalin or Trotsky. The Soviet Union has perished. In the midst of their feverish historical showdown, they seem to forget that none of these discussions are directly relevant to our contemporary cause, since material conditions and historical circumstances have developed and transformed into something unrecognizable to the context of the Russian Revolution from some hundred years ago. The whole tiresome discussion of permanent revolution versus socialism in one country is, in my assessment, wholly irrelevant in today's day and age. It used to be a burning issue whose discussion was had in the 20th century. So-called socialism in one country was tried and it self-evidently failed to reproduce itself under imperialist pressure. Contemporary circumstances, levels of globalization, interconnectedness and interdependence make all discussions about the viability of isolated socialist experiments entirely futile and will yield entirely different forms of struggle and novel discussions in the immediate future. 
that one belongs in the past. Thus, Trotskyists of today's day and age tend to hyperfixate on the phenomenon of Stalinism. They devote enormous amounts of time, energy, and attention to criticizing a system that is no more, and some of them arguably shape their whole theoretical line around guarding themselves from and dismissing Stalin's apparent betrayal of the revolution, his crimes and deficiencies. Comrades, it is time to move on. Whereas the 20th century naturally had great significance to our cause, practically and theoretically, and its correct analysis is self-evidently necessary, most working class people will simply never care. They simply won't and shouldn't care about disputes and debates from the winter of 1934 or whatever. As long as we keep wasting energy on internal skirmishes and infighting over momentarily irrelevant subjects, we no longer stand in the service of the immediate material needs of every working class person right here and right now. Fight, discuss, scream at each other endlessly, but for the love of God, make it relevant to our existing material circumstances. Petty sectarian politics and armchair philosophizing have never brought us any good, and history is the best witness of that. Now, the last group I'd like to touch upon would be sectarians of all types. Titoists, Hojaists, and all other isms that uphold a strict theoretical line of a certain flavor of socialism. Although I've already criticized many Stalinists and Trotskyists for being obsessed with the past and wasting energy on nitpicking and hyperfixating on former socialisms and labeling themselves with unnecessary additional isms, these types of sectarians tend to take this obsession one step further. They dogmatically uphold the political and revolutionary tactics of one specific local historical manifestation of socialism and advocate its schematic implementation in this day and age on an undefined scale. It is hopefully self-evident why this kind of ultra-dogmatic attitude towards former socialism is anti-Marxist at its core. Thankfully, this segment of the left is very insignificant and usually includes new, young leftists on the internet that follow their tribal impulse of finding a super niche ideology that they can use to nourish their ego. So herewith we come to a conclusion, derived from the previously discussed fallacious attitudes of some of our comrades. So what is to be done? First of all, we ought to defend former socialist experiments for their achievements and successes, accentuate the degree to which they improved the impoverished and maldeveloped societies they inherited, regardless of our objections and criticisms of their theoretical, political, administrative, or economic practices. Just like Marx himself did not shy away from applauding the revolutionary role of capitalism in the development of productive forces and overcoming feudal backwardness, despite being its harshest critic, we also should give credit where credit's due. We ought to celebrate their successes in providing mass housing, education, improved literacy rates, emancipation of women and ethnic minorities, healthcare, elimination of unemployment, their rapid industrialization and brave resistance to fascism and imperialism, but also their achievements in science, medicine, space exploration, engineering, and literature. We ought to insist on these very achievements in the face of reactionary lies, propaganda, and slander that try to obscure, hide, and misrepresent these brave revolutionary upheavals. Moreover, we shouldn't be afraid to admit to their mistakes. In fact, it is our intellectual duty to be their most ferocious critics, despite their sentimental, historic, and nostalgic value to our cause. Only through ruthless self-criticism and perpetual discussion can we hope for any kind of progressive momentum. Whereas embracing their successes ought to be priority number one when talking to all politically charged people and normies alike, within Marxist circles and organizations, only criticism and discussion can yield new perspectives and prospects, securing a steady dialectical growth of the general intellect of our social organism. Thus. Having slightly different priorities in external opposed to internal communication seems like the healthiest way to go. This nonetheless gives us the responsibility to deal with the burdens of injustices, crimes and mistakes of former socialism, whose undeniably paranoid existence under siege nonetheless led to many avoidable human casualties, 
not all of whom are inevitable collateral damage of quote-unquote material conditions. We should therefore be lucid about their catastrophic policies of forced collectivization and flawed political decisions that led to mass famines. We should be brutally honest about the inhumane policies of forced displacement and oppression of ethnic populations based on delusional political conclusions, such as the Crimean Tatars in the USSR or the Uyghurs in modern China. We must admit the unnecessary alienation and injustice that was done to religious communities throughout, with the unnecessarily harsh crackdowns on religion. We must also be clear about their aggressive attitude towards the LGBTQ community, based on pseudoscientific garbage and paranoid quote-unquote anti-bourgeois crackdowns that ended up targeting already marginalized innocent people. We also must humanely assess the brutality of Stalinist purges and silencing of persecution of comrades for various reasons. The list of mistakes is virtually endless, and we will explore many of them in dedicated videos. The point is, however, that just because a movement or a country is revolutionary in character does not make it immune to mistakes and injustices, and not everyone who criticizes them is an imperialist stooge and saboteur who wants to discredit their achievements. Two things can be true at the same time. Furthermore, with all successes and failures in mind, we still need to stay sober about the fact that all of this is in the past, and indulging in fetishization and obsessive cult-like devotion to these long-gone movements and their leaders is counterproductive and damaging to our cause. Equally so, basing our entire personalities and arrogantly dismissing all past experiences and presuming we would have done better if we had the power is equally wrong. Both of these fallacious attitudes fall in the hands of stereotypes about leftists who delusionally defend or arrogantly dismiss the burden of the 20th century. We can and must do better than that. We must admit to ourselves that those experiments failed for a reason, for a plethora of interconnected, unfortunate circumstances, imposed pressure and sabotage, but also avoidable political mistakes and injustices. Soviet-style socialism failed in the 20th century in the sense that it could not reproduce socialist societal relations and proved that the world stage was unfortunately unripe for a full communist revolution. Imperialism prevailed. This, however, does not in turn mean that progressivism has failed entirely, as we have seen how these countries managed to achieve unprecedented levels of development in 20 years, that took Western industrial powers over 200 years. This was essentially their ultimate achievement and historical significance, but also a big reason for the intensified amount of mistakes and misery. These mistakes were the cost of conducting rapid industrialization condensed into only a few decades' time, a cost that was distributed more gently in the imperial core through centuries of time at their disposal. Maybe they failed to introduce world communism, but they lifted millions out of poverty and feudal backwardness, doing a great service to the peoples of the developing world. This was their ultimate historical significance. Conclusively, we cannot let the ghosts of our past haunt us. We must be capable of imagining new futures in accordance to perpetually changing circumstances. In our service, we have to employ modern technologies, technical capabilities, scientific advancements, historical insights, and revolutionary tactics if we plan to come face to face with capitalism that already wields and integrates all of these novel instruments for its own purposes. If we plan on succeeding, we must collectively step up our game. The frontiers of class struggle and socialist planning are expanding into the domain of cybernetics, automation, and the virtual world with ferocious velocity. If we fail to convert these phenomena into instruments for our own struggle, for the conception of a more humane society, then somebody else will. The clock is ticking, and the enemies of mankind are not sparing a single second in morphing these technologies according to their class interests. This is not a call for utopian leftist unity and impossible dismissal of real differences. It is a call for unequivocal class solidarity and democratic centralism.